The most recent Dark Side of the Ring episode tackled the life and career of Chris Colt. And if you are wondering, who the hell is Chris Colt? Uh, you were not alone, because I was asking that same question. I knew nothing about the man coming into this episode. So I enjoyed hearing about somebody I did not know anything about, as opposed to running through the same stories I've already heard a million times before for the people I do. One of the cool things about the episode was their use of excerpts from his unpublished memoir. He never finished it, but these were his actual writings. And so throughout the episode, they would have someone narrating some of the passages, which added a, a good amount of context to the story in, in the man's own words. Again, Jim Cornette, he was the wise man of the episode. He called Colt the best wrestler that nobody saw. He was a gay wrestler in an era where it still was not accepted. He was also strung out of his mind most of the time. They told a story of a steel cage match that he was booked in where he had taken LSD. I guess he took a hit of it before coming out to the ring. Once he was inside the cage, he started hallucinating and seeing giant spiders climbing into the cage after him, and he completely freaked out. I did too, watching this reenactment they did with the giant spiders. I don't know where they found them, but this was terrifying. So he climbs out of the cage, and he starts punching people, thinking that they're giant spiders too. Drugs are bad, people. Very bad. One wrestler who knew him back then said that Chris used to say, I can't work if I'm not high. He tried to work sober, he just couldn't do it, he had to be high. He never stayed in any one place for any length of time, so he was somebody who bounced around a lot of different territories in the 70s and in the 80s. Uh, interesting little trivia note, he was Magnum TA's opponent in Magnum's very first wrestling match. So he idolized Janis Joplin, who was a rock star of her era. She died of a drug overdose when she was only 27 years old. He would tell people, I plan to be dead at 27 just like Janis Joplin. He ended up living to 49. Still young, but not as young as he wanted to. The way he lived his life, it's amazing he didn't end up dead a lot sooner than that. In his writings, he admitted to having feelings for both men and women, but he was more attracted to men. He badly wanted to become a pro wrestler. He prostituted himself in the streets to make money. Uh, he ended up at a tag team with a wrestler named Ron Dupree, who also became his lover. They had to keep their relationship hush-hush because otherwise it would make it harder for them to find work if people knew they were more than just tag team partners. After Ron was forced into retirement due to a heart attack, uh, Colt had to find a new tag team partner. Enter Bill Anderson, who was interviewed for this. As crazy as the LSD spider story was, there was another story where Chris, Bill, and a wrestler by the name of Mike Boyette... They became a trio, and they were on the road in the car traveling one night. Chris was getting high in the back seat. what else is new, and he randomly punches Bill, who's driving the car. He punches him in the back of the head, and he starts fighting with Mike. He's fighting with Bill, probably, again, drugged out out of his mind. Well, Mike Boyette was no one to mess around with. He was a Vietnam vet. He had a, a judo background. He was a, a world judo champion. Chris gets out of the car, and he is still being very aggressive. He takes a shot at Mike, who ends up dropping him with a front face lock. He puts him out, lets go. It's like the Richard Belzer thing, right? Or what Punk tried to do to Jack Perry. Chris's body falls limp. He falls down to the pavement. This is in the middle of the road, somewhere, in the middle of the night. He's out cold. He tells Bill, get back in the car. Mike gets in the car with him, and he tells Bill, back the car up. He's like, why? Just back the car up. So he backs the car up, and what he wants him to do, he wants him to run this fucking guy over. He takes his foot, Mike does, puts it over Chris's foot, or rather uh, uh, Bill's foot, on the gas pedal, because he wants him to run this man over and kill him. He is determined to kill Chris Colt and put an end to this once and for all. And he would have, had Bill not swerved at the very last second to avoid turning Chris into roadkill. And then Mike was like, just, just get out of here. So they left him. They left him in the middle of the road and they drove off. Chris's lover, Ron Dupree, eventually uh, he dies of a heart attack. He was uh, doing ring announcing at a small show somewhere and he died. 
in Chris's arms, and Chris was never the same after that. He changed his gimmick from Chris Colt to the Chris Colt experience. Maybe that's where uh, Cornette got it from. And he starts acting even more bizarre, coming out to Alice Cooper's Welcome to My Nightmare. Cornette claims that Colt invented modern entrance music in pro wrestling. So was it Chris Colt, or was it the Freebirds? I feel like I've heard Cornette and, and other people credit multiple people for ushering in the era of theme music in pro wrestling. Apparently now it's uh, Chris Colt who ushered it in. So then later on, he adopted a Nazi gimmick. He became Chris Von Colt. You know, in the 50s, coming out of World War II, Nazis were... They were all the rage in pro wrestling as heels. Uh, but this wasn't the 1950s. This wasn't the 1960s. This wasn't the 1970s. This was the 80s, so he was just being an asshole. And his drug addictions, they spiraled out of control. He goes from cocaine, now he's on crystal meth. His career is over by the late 80s. He just disappears off the face of the earth. Nobody knew where he was. Until someone happened to be watching an adult film that he was in. He had gotten into gay porn. And he had filmed a couple of movies. I mean, he really... It wasn't like a career. I think he did two films uh, for this one director. And we got some snippets of the stuff that he did. Not not, <laughs> not that stuff. But there were some snippets from the films. Just promos that he was apparently cutting in the films. Uh, there was one part where he's lifting weights. I, I will say I actually laughed out loud at this. He He's lifting weights, cutting a promo, and he says, Another victory! One more time, someone goes down, and they're going to go down on me. I I just, I started cracking up. That was, <laughs> I was not expecting that. So they actually found the director of the films that he did, and they interviewed him for the episode. Now, this guy has a PhD. He's worked as a university professor teaching film and literature. He's written something like 20 books. And they found this guy, and he said back then, Hulk Hogan was like a god in the gay community. And when the WWF would run shows at the Cow Palace in San Francisco, you would have tons of gay men there rooting him on. Rooting, rooting for Hulkamania. And here I thought the kids were his uh, biggest demographic. Little did I know. But there isn't much else to the story after this. Uh, that's kind of the nuts and bolts and the interesting stuff that I took out of it. You know, Chris passed away in 1995. He was found, according to his niece, in a back alley somewhere in Seattle. How he got there, she doesn't know. Someone else says he was found with a needle in his arm. His death certificate listed HIV as a factor in his death, although there was no autopsy performed. And Jim Cornette says that he was ahead of his time and he brought Rock into wrestling long before Hulk Hogan and Cyndi Lauper did. Lenny Poffo actually uh, tagged with Chris back in uh, 1976. And Lenny Poffo once called him the greatest wrestler that never made it. One of the Moondogs, Ed Moretti, was another tag team partner of Chris's. Also happens to be Nick Wayne's grandfather. He said that Chris was one of the greatest workers he's ever seen. He would rank him up there with Ray Stevens and Pat Patterson. I'm glad I know more about who he is, because I came into this not knowing anything about him. The story is pretty thin, because there just wasn't a whole lot to his career, but I think it fits the bill for what Dark Side of the Ring is supposed to be, and I can appreciate an episode here and there on a subject that hasn't already been beaten to death a thousand times. <laughs>